All right. Thanks again for joining me this afternoon. My name is Liz Schaller, and I am the NIMAC manager. I'm joined today by Alexa Miller, who's the NIMAC librarian. I'm sure many of you have emailed or called or interacted with her as well. And we're here today to uh, talk to you about your accessible media producer account with the NIMAC. Uh, the presentation today will start with uh, going through some slides, talking about kind of the basics of the NIMAC system and how it operates, uh, some key updates and kind of news items. And then I'll move into a demo portion where I'll show you how to do some of the things that I talk about during the presentation. Uh, and again, I'll pause several times during the presentation and you are welcome to ask questions out loud at that time. Otherwise, please do put them in the chat and we'll kind of keep an eye on that and, uh, and, and monitor them as we go. So let's go ahead and get started just with some kind of basic background information about the NIMAC. Uh, for some of you, this might be uh, pretty repetitive if you've been to uh, training with us in the past, so just bear with me. But I know we have plenty of new accessible media producers on board, so hopefully this will be, uh, be some good and helpful information for you. So the NIMAC project was created by IDEA 2004. And we are the national source file repository for K through 12 textbooks and instructional materials. We make NIMAS files available for use in producing accessible formats like Braille or large print or digital files for K through 12 instructional materials. To date, we have over 76,000 file sets in our system from over 180 different educational publishers. And we're happy to note that all 50 states, as well as the six outlying areas that are eligible to work with us, uh, as well as the Department of Defense, do all work with the NIMAC. So the, the NIMAC receives files in the NIMAS file format, and NIMAS stands for National Instructional Materials Accessibility Standard. Uh, this is a special file format that's it's not a byproduct of uh, the traditional textbook um, publishing process. Instead, it's, it's an XML-based source file format, um, and it comes as a package file. Uh, with several different components, and it can be used to produce Braille, DAISY, EPUB, um, large print audio files. Uh, one important thing to note is that it is not a file format that is intended for distribution directly to students. It is instead a production file format. So um, some type of intervention is required before the NIMAS file is, is converted into an accessible format that's ready for a student. And one thing that I just want to note about the fact that NIMAS files are not a byproduct of the traditional publishing process is that if we don't have a file in the system at the time that you need it, it can take, you know, four to six weeks, sometimes even longer for that NIMAS file to be produced once uh, a need for an accessible format has been identified. And I'll talk a little bit more about the implications of that, uh, as well as the uh, system that we have built in for you to request materials that aren't listed in the system. I'll talk about that a little later. Under IDEA, the only mechanism that requires NIMAS from the publisher is the book adoption contract or purchase agreement. So there is no blanket requirement for publishers to submit files to the NIMAC. And uh, instead, states and districts have been able to require NIMAS when they purchase new textbooks since 2006. So the way that the NIMAC is supposed to work is that when the need for an accessible format is identified, uh, the NIMAS file will already be in the system because the customer will have requested that NIMAS file at the time when they purchased or adopted those textbooks. The NIMAC receives a wide range of student-facing instructional materials. This includes textbooks, workbooks, uh, supplement tree readers, as well as some ancillary materials such as Blackline Masters. Uh, there are some important categories of materials that are exempt from the NIMAC, and these include teacher's editions, books that are uh, used just 
by the teacher. Um, the exception to that is that occasionally we do receive the student facing pages of some teachers materials. Uh, those are those may be submitted to us by a publisher. Sometimes they are requested in a contract, uh, especially, you know, a teacher, a teacher book uh, or workbook that has a lot of worksheets that are given directly to students. We could receive just those worksheet pages in a NIMAS file. Uh, we also don't receive pre-2006 titles, so pre um, the NIMAC becoming operational. We don't receive trade book files uh, with the exception that occasionally you will find files in the system for trade books that are specifically tied to a curriculum and distributed by an educational publisher as part of their reading curriculum. So that is the exception to that. Uh, we don't receive college textbooks, uh, nor do we receive reference books. Also just wanna note that the NIMAC can now accept NIMAS files for some digital instructional materials that, again, those are uh, digital instructional materials that can conform to the NIMAS specification. And I will say last calendar year, we started to receive some more uh, files for digital materials. So I think that that language is beginning to be included in more um, adoption contracts and purchase agreements, which is great. We're happy to see that. All right, so if you are working with the system as an as uh, an accessible media producer, it's very important that you know what your uh, what an authorized user of the NIMAC is. An authorized user is someone who has been designated by their state coordinator to have an account that provides full access to the NIMAC repository. So authorized users of the NIMAC are able to search and download any file uh, or assign that file to you all to registered accessible media producers. Typically, these individuals are from um, an SEA or possibly a, a large uh, LEA, um, maybe an instructional resource center, uh, again, the State Department of Ed, possibly a school for the blind. Um, typically, about four to six individuals per state um, who have that full access to the repository. Then you all as AMPS um, have accounts that allow you to download any file that is assigned to you by one of those authorized users. The AMP accounts are freely available to any organization or individual. And um, as long as you are working to uh, produce accessible formats on behalf of qualifying students. And uh, AMPs don't have to be designated by the state coordinator, but again, you do have more limited access to the system. You're only able to download files that have been assigned to you. Sometimes we get the this question from AMPs if you sh maybe should be an authorized user instead of an AMP. Uh, and sometimes that might be true. If you do regularly need direct access to download files from the system, it may be appropriate for you to be designated as an authorized user. Uh, this is something that uh, will be done by your state coordinator. Uh, and again, to be an authorized user, you do need to be a part of the educational structure in your state um, or a nonprofit that qualifies as an authorized entity. Um, and so if, if you do have any questions about that, if if you're wondering about your status uh, and possibly uh, getting that other account type, please do reach out to us and we can work with you on that and, and connect you with your state coordinator. One side note that I just wanted to mention um, is the APH AMP directory. Uh, so the AMP information, the information that you have listed in the NIMAC, that is not public facing. Uh, authorized users can access that information only through their NIMAC accounts when they're logged in. If you're interested in sharing your information publicly about the services you offer, uh, we would encourage you to participate in the Accessible Media Producers directory that is linked off of um, Bluey, which is hosted by APH. And that is a searchable online directory. It's a free service, but it is separate from the NIMAC. Uh, and if you are interested in being listed there, you can reach out to uh, resource, so R E S. O-U-R-C-E at APH.org for more information about that. Okay, so that was kind of a quick overview of background information. Does anyone have any questions about that before we move on? I think we are all good in the chat. 
Awesome. Okay, great. Well, let's proceed then to uh, file assignments. Once you have an active AMP account in the system, any authorized user in any state is able to assign you files for download. So if you're working on a project for a state or a district and you need help locating an authorized user in that state to assign you the NIMAS file, please let us know. So the authorized user in the state um, where the student is that you're working on behalf of, they are the ones that will need to assign you that file. Um, so again, we're happy to help connect you with someone if you're not already connected. And whenever you are assigned a file by, by an authorized user, the NIMAC system will send you an automated email that will let you know that the file is available for download in your queue. That notification will let you know what time or what item has been assigned and what accessible format is being requested, uh, as well as what user made the assignment. And um, I will show you this in the system when we go in and look, but just to note that the accessible format that's being requested, um, that functionality in our system only allows individuals to request one format. So it's, not, it's by no means restricting you to produce just the requested format. Say for instance, they request, you know, digital UEB, um, that doesn't mean that you can't also uh, produce the hard copy Braille as well. So it's it's not limiting you, um, but they do specify one format when they uh, make that file assignment. And uh, on your screen now is just a screenshot of what that email would look like that will include that, again, the title and ISBN information, uh, who assigned you the file, as well as the uh, requested format. We do want to note that all automated emails from the NIMAC will show as the sender uh, no reply hyphen NIMAC at overdrive.com. And uh, we know that spam filters are increasingly more aggressive. And uh, just this email, these automated emails may at some point be filtered out for you. So we would recommend uh, whitelisting that email address to ensure that you are receiving those automated emails. So you do know when those files have been assigned to you. Um, you might have to reach out to your IT administrator. I think especially if you work in a school district, some um, district email filters we've noticed, we've even had trouble getting through just from the NIMAC email account. So, um, and, and again, if you all on your end are having trouble with it, uh, please never hesitate to reach out to us and we can try to help troubleshoot if you're not receiving those email notifications. Another thing I wanted to note is um, that things have changed a little bit when it comes to updating your format capabilities in the NIMAC. Uh, initially, when you first register with the NIMAC, you select uh, your format capabilities that will be listed in your account. And these can be viewed uh, in under user information, my account. I'll show you that during the demo section. It used to be that uh, this list was not able to be updated by you and that you would have to reach out to us to update it. But uh, this year we've changed that. So now you are able to update that list at any time yourself. Uh, and this format information will be available to authorized users when they go in to assign new files. This is the current list of format capabilities. We did amend this slightly this past year. Um, and we mostly we removed eBay options that were uh, previously in the system. Uh, but we also did add EPUB as an option as well. Uh, so again, this is the current format capability list. And if you haven't already, uh, and you wanted to kind of double check and see which formats you've selected in your account, please do just log in You can go to your user information and take a look at that list and, and update it as needed. And this is just a screenshot that shows you where those uh, that format capability list shows up in your account. And I, I'll show this also during the demo portion. All right. Uh, switching gears a little bit, I want to go into a few policy updates, and then um, I'll pause again for questions. The first, uh, and we have mentioned this before, but if you are uh, new to the NIMAC especially, just to note that uh, in February of 2021, the National Library Service updated its eligibility guidelines, and it changed the guidelines, uh, most importantly for 
the NIMAC to expand the pool of professionals who can certify eligibility for NIMAS. IDEA 2004 points to the NLS guidelines for NIMAS eligibility as well. Uh, so uh, that important change, again, is that they eliminated the requirement that a medical doctor certify eligibility for individuals with reading disabilities. As a result of that, we did update our NIMAC limitation of use agreements. So if you have uh, registered as an AMP uh, since May 2021, this is not something to worry about because you already have the new agreement on file. But if you have been an AMP with us for a while and you can't remember if you filled out the new version of the agreement or not, um, please feel free to reach out to us. We're happy to double check and make sure that you have that new updated agreement on file. Again, this was, uh, I think these went out uh, in May or June of 2021. Uh, and we have a majority of folks with a new agreement on file, but there are a handful that we're still missing. So uh, if you're not quite sure, please feel free to reach out and we'll double check on that for you. Another update that I wanted to spend a minute on um, is related to the NIMA specification itself. So the NIMA specification is defined in the IDEA regulations and therefore updating it does require regulatory or legislative action. And it, it was originally intended to be an evolving specification, but of course IDEA is many years behind schedule for reauthorization. So this year, we, uh, the NIMAC, received supplemental funding from OSEP to explore possible updates to the NIMAC specification. We've done a few different things so far to gather some input for formal recommendations, including uh, sent out some surveys back in the fall. Thank you to everyone who participated in those. Um, tomorrow, actually, we're holding a small virtual focus group for our large print producers. And then uh, our kind of large culminating event is an in-person NIMAS convening that will be held in DC this May. Uh, so we are we are really in the middle of planning that and getting ready for that. Uh, and that will be a great a gathering of, of various stakeholders, you know, um, Braille software producers, uh, accessible media producers, uh, you know, SEA and LEA staff, publishers, um, as well as some uh, individuals from OSEP. And uh, all of this information gathering, uh, we are going to, to pull everything together into a formal report that we are going to provide to OSEP that will include the NIMAX recommendations for any possible updates to the specification. And uh, at that point, once they receive that report, the department could then initiate a formal process to update the specification. In addition to those formal recommendations for updates, we're also going to use what we've gathered to help us develop additional resources for our website, for our users, uh, whether it's trainings or, or written instructions. Um, to help better support both NIMAS production as well as NIMAS utilization. All right, so I'm gonna pause here again and see if there are any questions about what I've talked about so far. Hey Liz, Steve yeah. has a question regarding uh, medical doctors required to certify brain dysfunctions and learning disabilities. Do you happen to know if that's correct? I'm not sure if the language uh, talks about that specifically or not. I think that, as far as I know, I think that the NLS guidance is focused on, on print disability specifically, mm -hmm. um, but I would be happy to, um, Steve, if you want to send me an email, I'd be happy to, to look into that and send you any additional language if I can find it. All right. Was there, were there any other questions? Nope. I think that's it. Okay. Awesome. Thanks. Yeah. Well, let's go ahead then and move into um, kind of the, the system features, how you work, work in the system. And then, of course, uh, we'll hop over to the demo.
So the first thing I touched on this earlier is our watch list service. And our watch list service is spearheaded by Alexa. So if you've utilized it before, you've probably uh, spoken with her about your request. And this service is uh, for situations where the file that you need is not available in, in the NIMAC and you think that it maybe should be. You're not totally sure if it is uh, NIMAC eligible or not, um, but you, you think it may be. Uh, in your account, uh, there is a built-in built -in system where you can add that ISBN to your watch list. And then that triggers on our end to go in and research that item for you. And we'll reach out um, either with more information about uh, an, an alternative file uh, or possibly the files already in the system. I know many times we get requests for maybe bundle ISBNs. Um, and sometimes we have the material that you need actually in the system already, uh, just listed under that that book ISBN as opposed to the bundle ISBN. Um, and if we don't already have it in the system and, and it is eligible for NIMIS, we will reach out to the publisher and we have a very good uh, response rate from publishers being willing to fulfill those requests, even though they're not obligated to do so under IDEA, uh, by and large, the vast majority are are happy to to supply NIMIS when it's requested. Um, it can also be the case sometimes that maybe you are looking for a file that's not available yet, but the publisher is it's already in production. Uh, this especially comes up for books that maybe are needed for next school year. Um, so we'll let you know about that. We're able to ask the publisher and conversion vendor who's working on the NIMIS file to expedite that for you. And then if you add that ISBN to your watch list, you will receive an automated email when the file becomes available in the NIMAC. So then at that point, you would be able to reach out to the authorized user and request that they assign you that file. If the title you're looking for is outside of scope, we will research other accessibility alternatives and provide you with that information. Now switching gears a little bit, I wanna to touch on MathML, which is, if you're not familiar, MathML is optional XML markup for math and science notation. And the benefit of MathML is that when you are using software that supports it, it can be used to automatically generate braille or other formats from the NIMAS file. In the past, historically, math was most often provided in NIMIS as images, and that is still the case um, with, with some files. And of course, the uh, images, math images, can't be automatically converted into Braille. But many publishers are now providing MathML in their NIMIS files, um, and some, but not all, software supports translation of that MathML. If the NIMIS file that you are using includes MathML, but your software doesn't support it, you are still able to choose to download the file without MathML. And uh, I will show you about that and where you can see that um, as a download option during the demo. The NIMAC system will only show a no MathML download option if MathML is present in the file. So. There are plenty of math and science files we receive that don't include MathML, and so you just won't see that option at all. Um, and so that's one easy way to know whether a file contains MathML. There are a few other ways as well that I'll show you here. Um, again, this is a screenshot of the page uh, where you would go when you're submitting your download request. And if the file does include MathML, you will see an option to do a full download no math ML if that's what you're looking for. So it will include all of those math images instead of the math ML tagging. At the bottom of uh, the bottom of the screen here, this is a screenshot of a system record. So this is another way to tell if your file has math ML. It will be included in the metadata for that textbook file in the bottom right corner of your screen, bottom of the second column of metadata. And then another way to tell, uh, maybe you downloaded this file a while back and you can't quite remember if you downloaded the file with or without MathML, you can actually open the XML file itself and you can tell in there if you have a file that has MathML. And the way to do that, again, this is a screenshot from the very top of a math 
of, of, a, of a NIMAS XML file. And you'll see highlighted here the MathML phrase. So um, if your file includes MathML, you'll see, um, you'll see this at the very top of your file. When it comes to working with NIMAS, we know um, that we are somewhat limited in the options for, for tools for conversion. And so we're very, very happy to say that there is now a free EPUB conversion tool available. We have been working pretty closely with the DAISY Consortium for about a year now, uh, testing their NIMAS to EPUB conversion tool. And we think it is now ready for NIMAC users to test. So uh, I think uh, Alexa will drop the link in the chat to download the most recent app version of the tool. And uh, I'm gonna walk through just talk you through the options to select when you are doing a NIMAS DEPUB conversion, but I'll also demonstrate this during the demo portion as well. So when you go in to convert a file, you're gonna to wanna to select the following menu options. There is a very long list of scripts to down um, to, to choose from in the in the DAISY pipeline. And this the particular script you're looking for is the DT book to EPUB script. So um, NIMAS is a subset of DAISY 3 or DT book. So um, that's why you're going to choose that script. There isn't specifically a NIMAS to EPUB script. Then once you select that, you're going to go down to the box that uh, gives you the option to select the file that you're looking for and, and select the NIMAS XML file you want to convert. You will need to unzip your NIMAS file and select just the XML. It's not going to convert your, um, your zipped up NIMAS package file. One other very important thing to note before you start the conversion process is that in the drop down that asks you about validation, you're going to need to select no validation because the uh, the EPUB validation in the tool right now is, is a bit inconsistent and it can cause your conversion to fail. So for now, just select no validation uh, and then check that NIMAS input box uh, and then you can run your conversion. We're really interested to hear more feedback on the tool as folks are using it. So if you are enjoying it, if you're struggling, if your files are mostly failing or mostly succeeding, we would love to hear from you about that. So please do reach out. Uh, our email is nymac at aph.org. Uh, or if you need more help getting started, we, we do also have a video, a how-to video that Alexa recorded, uh, um, posted on our website that just walks you through the steps when you are getting started using the tool. Uh, and I would recommend taking a look at that as well. I'll include links and a little bit more explanation about this when I send out uh, the email that, uh, that this AMP uh, training is posted on our website and available. I'll include a little bit more about the DAISY pipeline in that email as well. I also wanted to note uh, before we move on to the demo that we do still have our Braille 2000 and Duxbury user groups going strong. Uh, we started these last year uh, as uh, just user groups for transcribers who specifically work with NIMAS files. And we meet quarterly, they're virtual meetings and they're facilitated by experienced transcribers. And our first Duxbury user group meeting is actually tomorrow at 2.30 p.m. So uh, if you're interested in more information about that, if you didn't receive the email, uh, please reach out and I'll be happy to, to send you more information. And then we already had our first Braille 2000 user group meeting of the year, but our next one will be in June. All right, and then I just, this is just a screenshot of our website that shows you the Accessible Media Producer tab, which is where you can go to, to access more, more information about working with NIMAS files, as well as uh, more information about the, the pipeline. All right, so before uh, I switch over to the demo, does anyone have any questions? We are all quiet in the chat. Oh, wow. That must mean that I'm explaining everything perfectly. Excellent. All right. So let's hop on over to your NIMAC account. And actually, here, I'll log out so to show you the, the login screen. So this is what your uh, account landing page login page looks like. 
Uh, and one thing that we always like to note for folks is that we know that a lot of the time when you're logging into something, your username is your email address. And for the NIMAC, that is not the case. Uh, you will receive your login credentials when you uh, first register for your account. And if you ever lose track of them, if you aren't, you aren't sure what your username is, please don't hesitate to reach out. We'll send that over to you so you have it, but it is not your email address. I'm going to go ahead and log in here. Uh, so if you are logged in as an accessible media producer, your landing page is your title assignments page. And we'll come back to this in a little bit. I want to show you a few other things first, but this will be what it looks like when you first log into to your account. So right now, under user information, you can go to my account and you can see your um, your name and contact information, your organization information, including your mailing address will be listed here. And if you need changes to any of that information, uh, please reach out to us and we'll we'll edit that. Um, this is controlled information um, to make sure that we are keeping track of correct email addresses and phone numbers. So we'll make any edits that you need to that information if you reach out. And then um, down toward the bottom right of your screen, you'll see your format capabilities listed. And at the very bottom of that list, there is a button uh, that is just called update. So if you do need to make any updates, you can uh, scroll through the list, highlight the, uh, the items that you want, the format capabilities that you want listed in your account, and then you can hit save changes there to make sure you have the correct ones listed. I also wanted to show you under user information, my sub users. So this is where you can come to add additional users to your account. Uh, and this can be really valuable if you work in an agency uh, with multiple individuals, but you feel like it's easier to facilitate just having the one account for everyone to access. Um, so as, as the point person for the account, you can come here to add user. And you just need to include the first and last name as well as the email address of the individual. And then when you save changes, that person will be uh, will be assigned their own login credentials for your account. And they'll have access to everything in your account, but they'll have their own credentials. And these accounts don't expire. So you're able to kind of permanently add sub users and then you can remove them also as needed. So uh, under actions here, you can see, you can ask to reset the password. You can edit um, this information. Uh, if their email address changes, you can edit that. Or you can delete if that person leaves your organization and they no longer need that account. I also wanted to note here the publisher contact information list. Now, um, we do encourage if you do ever encounter problems with an IMIS file, please reach out to us and let us know because uh, we may be able to troubleshoot. It could be a situation where um, the issue is not with the NIMIS file itself, but with how the software you're using is working with the file. So we're able to do a little bit of troubleshooting on our end. Um, and then if we do see that there is an issue with the file, then we'll, we can reach out to the publisher and try to facilitate uh, some corrections being made to that file. And we do really appreciate it when people reach out to us and let us know when there are problems because um, NIMIS files can be used by multiple agencies to produce multiple formats. So, um, and in fact, that's very common. So if you do report an issue to us, then we may be able to get that file corrected for future use, for future accessible format production, which is great. Um, but if you do ever need to reach out to a publisher directly, you do have access to their contact information here. Their email addresses for the point people for their accounts are listed uh, under the admin contact information. So, uh, and that list is alphabetical. I also wanted to show you here your reports. So if you're ever interested in seeing your download activity, uh, in a spreadsheet format, uh, maybe because you know it's easier, you can kind of sort and filter that. Uh, you can export that here. Uh, you can organize it either by total downloads or unique by title, and you're able to put date parameters around that. And then again, it'll export to a CSV so you can open in Excel and, um, and take a look at that information there if that's useful to you. While we're here, I also want to show quickly the, the watch list. 
So I mentioned this earlier. This is where you can come if you are looking for an item in the system and it's not there, it's not listed at least by the ISBN that you have on hand. Um, you can put your put an ISBN in here. Yeah, let's just add one here. We also have a memo field and we really encourage folks to use this, especially um, because a lot of times if you're having trouble finding a material, it could be a state edition of material um, or something like that that can be hard to research uh, online. So uh, we do really encourage folks, if you do have title information, publisher information, copyright year information to include that in the memo line. So um, let's just say we'll call this geography. McGraw Hill 2025 and then hit create. Now, if the item is not already in the system, uh, you will get this message here that says successfully created new watch list item. Uh, one thing to note is that when you enter the ISBN, you want that ISBN to not include the hyphens. We do encourage people to copy and paste ISBNs as much as possible because it's just really easy to introduce a typo into an ISBN, but please do remove the hyphens if, if you are copying and pasting. And then down here uh, in your watch list list, you'll be able to see the date that you added the the ISBN, as well as the status. So here it says not submitted to the NIMAC, which means that we have not received that material. Um, there may be other statuses that show up here. Uh, if you, for instance, see a status that says certified, that means that the, the file was certified after you added it to your watch list. Um, the system won't allow you to add a file to your watch list that's already available in the NIMAC. So if I tried to add an ISBN that's already available, it would just say that the file's already certified in the NIMAC. Uh, so you can go back and check it. But um, but that will show here. There, you, there are, will also be um, a pending status if it's a file that has been submitted and we're in the process of reviewing it and certifying it. That will show up here as well. Um, and you are able to export your, your watch list if you ever have need to do that. All right, now well, let's go back to our title assignments. You can get to your title assignments through this link here. And uh, your main page on, for title assignments is your active queue. And so this will show all of the files that you haven't moved into your completed queue. And here you'll see the basic details about the material. You'll see your title, your identifier, which will be your ISBN with NIMIS after, and then the publisher information. The next common column will show you the format that was requested. And then the next column will show you which authorized user assigned you the file, followed by the date that it was assigned. And then if you've downloaded the file, you'll also see the date downloaded listed here as well. Um, there's a little checkbox at the very left of each item. And if you check that, you'll have a couple of options that show up. You'll either be able to add that file to your downloads or you'll be able to move it to your completed queue. Uh, some individuals who are working with a lot of files or uh, maybe it's just your really your busy season, it may be helpful to use that uh, completed queue to move over the files that you've already downloaded or the projects that you've already completed just to kind of keep this list nice and tidy, but you certainly don't have to do that. It's just an option. Um, and again, we'll we'll go ahead and take a look at the uh, add to my downloads option here. And that screen will pop up like I showed you earlier. And it'll give you the choice to complete the full download or the XML download. The NIMIS file package includes that XML file, which is what you would import into Braille software if you're a Braille producer. It also includes all of the images that were used in, um, in, the, in, the, in the textbook. So a full download of the NIMIS zipped file includes all of those images. But if you do not need the images for for your production process, you can simply choose the XML download. And the XML download tends to be a lot smaller and it'll process more quickly. So that's the benefit of that. But if you want the full file download, um, you can select that. And then 
the the below that shows the limitation of use agreement language. This is the agreement that you you signed and initialed uh, and completed when you registered for your accessible media producer account. It's the exact same language here. So you're always welcome to review it as needed. And then you just have to click that uh, you agree to abide by the Lua at the bottom. And then once you select that, you'll see at the top of your screen here that your download request was submitted and that it's being processed. And uh, that this little box here also includes a link over to my downloads. You can select that here, or you can always get to your downloads page as well in the top right hand navigation on your screen. On the My Downloads page, uh, the very top, there's an option here that you can check or uncheck as, as you want that will send you an email notification when your requested file is ready for download. Uh, so as you can see right now, uh, this file that we sent over to your, to your, your download queue uh, is listed as pending. So it hasn't processed yet. So uh, say you're trying to download a bunch of files at once or uh, a large file, or maybe you're just multitasking and you don't want to kind of here, wait here, refresh um, for to wait to wait for your file to be ready. Um, you can click this box, this checkbox, and you'll receive an email notification as soon as the file is ready. Um, but again, if you are just sitting here, you can refresh. And as long as it's a pretty small file, which this one is, it's just a little reader file, um, it really will take less than a minute, sometimes really just seconds to uh, for that file to process and be ready to download. Part of the processing uh, time is on the back end in our system. Every NIMIS file that you download is fingerprinted and watermarked. Um, and so that process is part of, of what is happening when you download the file. So it that file download, that source file is gonna be tied to your account. Um, and then you see here you have the option to download or delete. Uh, and again, you can see here when you go to your downloads page, which file type you chose to download, as well as the date that you added that file to your queue. Another thing that's handy um, here, you have this option on this screen, the download screen, as well as the title assignments screen is a search box where you can search within the files in your download queue or within the files uh, that have been assigned to you. And this can be very, very useful if you, um, again, uh, have quite a few files in your queue at any given time. You can kind of quickly get to the ones that you're looking for. Another thing I wanted to mention is that at the very top of your list uh, under your uh, title assignments, there is a checkbox that when you select it, selects every file that's listed. Um, and that can be dangerous sometimes, but it can also be really helpful if you've gone through and, you know, maybe you've requested five files for a particular project from an authorized user. They've assigned you all of them at once. Uh, you can just hit this checkbox and it will check all of them. And then you can um, you can do a, a, a batch action. Uh, in that case, if you are downloading all of the files at once, the only thing I will note is that you do have to select the same download option for all files in a batch operation. So you can't download some full and some just XML. They have to be all the same. I also wanted to quickly show you the search option as well. Again, as an accessible media producer, you don't have the option to download everything in the system, but you can search the NIMAC inventory uh, while you're logged in. You can search it when you're not logged in as well. It is public facing, but you can search while you're logged in. So say you uh, you do, you did receive a request for, uh, for an accessible format and you wanna double check the system before you reach out to an authorized user, you can just do that while you're logged in. Um, we do recommend searching by the ISBN uh, as as if you have it. That will be your best search, unhyphenated ISBN. Um, but say you don't, uh, and it, or maybe you're looking for a whole program's worth of files. Um, you can search by title or um, or series keyword 
in the search. And then you can use our filters that are on the, the left side of your screen to filter down your results. So maybe you're looking for a particular state edition. In this case, there are Tennessee files, illustrative math Tennessee files. And then maybe you're looking for a particular copyright year uh, or a particular grade level. You can narrow it down um, and you're able to export these search results into, again, it'll be into a spreadsheet. So if, if this is something that you're doing uh, proactively to see if the files are in the system, you can export these results and send them to your authorized user who will then be able to kind of quickly go in and, and assign those files to you in the system. And I think that about covers all of the functionality that I wanted to make sure to touch on in the system. Does anyone have any questions about any of that? Nothing in the chat, except that you are doing a great job. Oh, well, good, I'm glad. Um, and we're always happy to answer questions. I know sometimes uh, it can, maybe you don't use the NIMAC very frequently, and maybe you just aren't totally sure how something works, please never hesitate to reach out to us. We are always happy to help. Um, and if no one has any questions about the system, I will hop over, just do a real quick demo of the DAISY pipeline, because again, we are really excited about it, and we really hope that this is going to be a beneficial beneficial tool for folks, um, for, for students who need digital formats. Um, this is what the app looks like once you have it, uh, have it installed on your platform and in order to start a new project you just uh you just hit that plus sign at the top of the screen and like i mentioned earlier if you look at this drop down list of scripts there are quite a few options and we are interested in the dt book to epub 3 script specifically once you select that, you'll see some options for your required information. The first of those, of course, is um, is your uh, NIMAS file. And I need to, I just realized, I need to unzip the one that I just downloaded earlier to make sure that I can. Because like I said, you can't open the zipped file. You can only open the XML file in the pipeline. OK unzipped now. So now you can see that unzipped folder was an option for me and I'm, not, I'm just navigating to my XML file and opening that up there. Then you're going to come down, you can just skip the language code option, come down to this validation drop box and hit no validation. Make sure you do that before you process. There's a little checkbox here for NIMAS input and we just want to check yes because we are inputting NIMAS. And then these other options, you can just skip them. You don't need to change anything or add anything here. Then at the very bottom left uh, of your screen, you'll see a button that says Run. And you'll click that. And uh, your file will start processing. I will say this can take a little bit longer than like an, a NIMAS download takes to process, particularly if it's a large file. We have been testing with a variety of file sizes. And we're pretty happy with the um, the, the this most recent version of the pipeline in terms of being able to process larger files. But you may run into an issue if, if you have a really massive file. That is a possibility. And it will definitely take longer. Um, I tried to select a file, a small file, to process to hopefully take just, just a minute or so so that you'll be able to see um, see the results here. So we'll just let it do its thing. And you'll just see it'll start a bunch of different messages will start popping up as it's processing. You can see the status at the top of um, running. And again, this is a free tool. So this is something that um, that you'd be able to just download and, and, and play around with and see if it's if it's helpful for you. Um, one thing we are interested in, if, if you are an accessible media producer who who produces digital formats, um, we are currently doing some uh, testing and evaluating of, of EPUB readers, uh, and we're interested in which ones are kind of most commonly used in the classroom right now that you're seeing uh, students using. So if that is something that you have any expertise in and you want to share with us, that would be great. Um, and so now you can see at the top of your screen, status completed, progress 100%. 
And under results, you can open results folder, folder or you can go, you can click here and go to your EPUB and then it'll take you right to that document. I'm gonna go ahead and right click on it and choose, uh, choose an EPUB reader to open it. And I'm gonna use Calibre, I have Calibre installed. All right. And there you have it. You got your um your EPUB file from your from your NIMIS file here. And you can see it has hyperlinks. Um and again, we're we're really interested in in how this tool works for you. So if you do happen to to take a look at it, please send us any feedback at all that you have. Does anyone have any questions about that? I'm not seeing anything in the chat. Okay, awesome. Well, thanks everyone for being here today. Uh, before you go, Alexa is going to put a link in the chat for a really short exit survey. Just, it's like three questions long. It'll take you less than a minute. Uh, and this is uh, something that's really important. We use it uh, for our reporting back to OSAP. And then we also use it to inform our future trainings and materials that we have um, available to you on our website. So if you could take just one minute to complete that and give us your feedback. That would be wonderful. We'd really appreciate it. And thanks everyone for being here.